for the podcast. Today I have with me James Jacobson. He is a multi-passionate dog lover, and I'm happy to talk with you today, James. Thank you for coming on the show. Chris, it is great to be here. I'm delighted. And so tell us just a little bit about yourself. Well, I think you 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 just hit it on the head when you said a multi-passionate dog lover, because uh, for a very long time, my life has sort of gone to the dogs. Uh, I uh, just love dogs, and I have been blessed to be able to build businesses around my passion for dogs, which is really an amplification of people who love dogs. And, and so I, I sort of see the differences between like dog owners and dog lovers. And uh, I, 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 you know, I'm, I definitely fall in the, in the second camp. I'm a dog lover. That's wonderful. And you didn't get your first dog until you were an adult. I did not. Uh, when I, I wanted a dog when I was forever and ever when I was a kid. And my parents promised me that when I turned 10, I would get a dog. And I did everything to, to curry their favor and to prepare for this white dog that I had imagined and didn't have a name for it, but I knew oh, this is where she will sleep. And I, I had planned everything. And this is not, you know, something I started at nine and a half. This is probably something I started at five. So for many, for many, many, many years, I was promised that on my birthday in October, when I turned 10, I would get a dog. So you can only imagine how excited I was to race down the steps on my birthday for the time when I would be presented with my dog. And there at the dining room table was a box with a bow. And I was like, that is really cool. How is the dog breathing? Okay. It's, and I open it up and it's a tape recorder. Oh. So I didn't get my dog when I turned 10. Uh, I didn't get my first dog until many, many years later after college. Uh, but, uh, and instead of, uh, I ended up getting a white Maltese and pretty much I've had Maltese since then. That's, that's awesome. So you have one Maltese or two Maltese? Currently we have two. We have uh, Kanga and Rue, uh, and, uh, Rue is a rescue and they're both, uh, Maltese and they were sort of both geriatric at this point. Uh, but they eat really well and, uh, they live a very good life here and, and they go to the beach and they're just very happy dogs. And so you live in Hawaii. So my interpretation of Hawaii is it, it's warm, it's hot. Is that true? It is. It is uh, definitely warmer than Colorado. Yeah. Uh, and it, yeah, it's, it's sort of a, a paradise. I guess a lot of people uh, have visions of it as paradise. And for me, it's my paradise for sure. And so are there any special considerations that you uh, undertake for your dogs living in a, in a warm climate? So we, yeah, we keep our, our dogs uh, hair cut short because it gets warm. And so they're in puppy cuts. Um, but other than that, you know, we just do the, the normal things that you do for a dog. But when you talk about Hawaii in general, there are like many years ago, I used to commute between Washington, D.C. and Maui. 72 trips over 13 years. I was totally commuting uh, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And uh, the reason for that is that I had that first dog, that Maltese, whose name was Maui, and I couldn't bring her to Hawaii because there was a quarantine law here. And so uh, that had been on the books longer than the state of Hawaii had been a state. So one day when I lived in Colorado, I built and sold one of my companies. I, I had moved to Colorado. I opened up the, the curtains on the um, patio door and the snow had drifted all the way to the top of the door. And I looked at my little Maltese Maui and I said, we are going to change this law because I'm going to get you to Hawaii. So uh, we, uh, I formed a, a group with a bunch of other passionate dog lovers and we ended up changing the laws related to quarantine. And so you didn't have to put a dog into quarantine. If you did all the stuff ahead of time correctly, uh, they had something called airport release. So we got uh, Maui sort of as a poster child for this campaign to uh, be able to live in Maui. And uh, so since uh, 2003, I've lived here full time. Wow. That's, that's so interesting. And uh, it's wonderful that you were able to do that for all the dog lovers who do live over there on the islands. 
it 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 is it's it's a it's a really you know i think there are a lot more people who uh feel more comfortable making the rather significant decision to move from the mainland to hawaii knowing that if they do everything right they can bring their dog without putting it into quarantine for at one point it was 90 days and it went down to 60 and 30 and now they have a, a program called airport release and the the genesis behind the the quarantine issue was Hawaii, like other islands like England and Australia, mm -hmm. are, are, do not have any rabies. And so it was about keeping Hawaii rabies free. And they may have gone a little overboard in that because obviously if you're bringing, you, you not bring a rabid dog to Hawaii, it just would be very obvious. But, uh, but they were very protective because it is an island ecosystem. And so once we did all this stuff to make sure that the dog has the enough of the rabies titer tests, and you put an avid chip in its neck and you can verify all this stuff and do all this paperwork, then you can have your dog released. Wow, that's cool. And one of the things I just found out about you as being a dog lover all your life is you have a meditate with your dog book. I do. So when I, so as I said, I, so when I moved to Hawaii, I had been, I guess, a successful entrepreneur and I had built and sold some companies and I was like, thinking about like retiring what am I going to do how am I going to reinvent myself when I move here and this is a very different economy and a very different place to live than anywhere else that I had lived in DC and in Colorado briefly and I said well I'll write a book and I didn't know exactly what to write a book about I could write a book about marketing but I was like the world doesn't need another marketing book but what I had been doing for a very long time is meditating with my dog. And I had actually, cause I believe that just sitting in meditation, sort of a, a non dogmatic type of meditation for 10, 20 minutes a day can really make life a lot better for, for you and for everyone in the world. So I, I definitely believe in that. And I had, and I had tried to advocate or teach people about different meditation techniques. And I've been meditating my whole life and the, the, the gimmick, I guess, if, you'll, if you will, that, that I was able to get people to try meditation with mm -hmm. is by leveraging, or what I would call leveraging, their affection for their dog. So, because dogs are natural meditators. Dogs are very much living in the present moment. They're not thinking about the future or the past. They're just like there. They, they tend to be in that hound lounge where like one eye is open, one eye is closed. And I would teach people how to meditate with their dog. So I wrote a book on how to meditate with your dog and um, built a publishing company to publish it. And we published other people like Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who, who won the Nobel Prize. So it's not just like a, a, a small self, you know, vanity press. Mm -hmm. uh, but we published, because I, I built company. So we built a publishing company. We, our, was when our second book was how to meditate with your dog. And I got a ton of publicity. I was on Jay Leno and CNN and I flew on Oprah's jet and all sorts of things to share the message that, you know, meditating with your dog is a very accessible thing. And so that was, that was sort of the thing that really accelerated my understanding of the dog market. And it probably, well, benef a benefit of meditating with your dog is that bonding time. Do you think that that's a good? Oh, absolutely. Well, it's good for the dogs. It's good for the people. Sometimes, and sometimes people will do things that are good for their dogs. You know, they're more likely to do something to help their dog than to help themselves in so many ways. And so, if they, well, it's good for the dog. It'll help reduce separation anxiety. It'll calm the dog down. I'll be able to go to work without coming home and the dog tearing everything apart because I meditated. And so they would do it, but of course they were deriving benefits. I got letters from uh, people who like, my father had a heart attack and uh, the doctor said, you have to just calm down. You have to meditate. You just have to you know, live a less stressful life. And he wouldn't do any of that. And then I found this book in the store and because he loves his dog, he started meditating and that is a miracle. And, and I got tons of people who, who, who sort of embraced meditation it sounded a little new age, a little woo-woo, but they'll do it for their dog. So that, that's, that was the fun part. 
we all will do a whole lot of things for our dogs. So true. It's yeah. So true. And another thing that I really like about you and what you do is functional nutrients. Tell us about that. And I'll tell you why I like it afterwards. Sure. Um, so, uh, so Maui Media, the publishing company, we published um, a book that has now become the best-selling animal health book in the English language called The Dog Cancer Survival Guide by Dr. Dressler and Dr. Ettinger, who are, who are veterinarians. One's a veterinary oncologist. One is a what we call a full-spectrum vet. That is a, a, a really significant book. It's like 500 pages. It is the... Um, the 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 bible if you will of dog cancer and unfortunately as you know cancer is the number one killer of dogs mm -hmm. one in three dogs get cancer and one in two over the age of 10 die of cancer it's a serious problem so we maui media did this book and one of the things that dr dressler discovered in the process of putting this book together and really rethinking the common approaches to cancer is how important diet is. And he looked at uh, specific things that were important to helping dogs with cancer. And one of those is dietary apoptogens. And an apoptogen is basically a natural sub or a substance that helps to support apoptosis. What's apoptosis? It's programmed cell death. So every day a normal cell is born it lives, it dies, and that dying process is regulated through apoptosis. Well, in cancer, uh, there's not, one of the hallmarks of cancer is the lack of normal apoptosis. So he said there are gotta be things in nature that help support apoptosis. And he discovered these things that come from like parsley and they're bioflavonoids. They come, they're very, there's particular uh, phytochemicals that come from natural plants. And so he started recommending that people chop up lots of parsley and put it in their dog's diet and, 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 and look for these other uh, ingredients. And they were very hard to find and source and to do. And someone said, well, what if there was a pill? So yeah. again, I'm the entrepreneur. I said, okay, so let's, so I, I funded some research. We spent a lot of money, a lot of energy to develop this incredible, uh, nutritional supplement uh, called ApoCaps. Um, and it uh, basically is, is what functional, one of the it's, the, it's the star product, I guess, from functional nutriments. Um, and ApoCaps has been around since, well, we started that in 2008, it came to market in 2010. So it's been a lot of time on the market and used by veterinarians and oncologists and dog lovers all over the world. Um, millions and millions of doses and it's just a really wonderful product and then everpup which is the daily dog supplement uh is an extension of that and we do some other stuff for veterinarians as well so that's that's functional nutrients because what i like about it is because i don't know about you as much as my dog loves her food yeah. and she does i could put a ton of parsley in there i could put a ton of greens in there and you know she ain't gonna do it she ain't gonna eat it she isn't gonna eat anything <laughs> Right. And and the pill is really, uh, it just makes sense. Well, it's it's a wonderful thing, and diet is such an important part of 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 caring for a dog that either has cancer or keep your dog healthy, so you never have to deal with it. And so I learned a tremendous amount by just you know being in the orbit of Dr. Dressler about how to care for dogs. And I cook for my dog. Like this morning, I made last night. I made a chicken for the dogs, uh, and I, I do lots of stuff. And then sprinkle Everpup on it. And uh, I just you know I when I first got a dog, I was one of those. Oh, just throw some kibble at it, whatever some good you know whatever the vet recommends. But the more I have learned about the importance of nutrition, just like for people. Um, I, I give that to my dogs because, because I love them. <laughs> well, we do. And to think of your dog getting cancer, I've had some clients whose dogs have had cancer and they had the means to take care of them and help them and get them through it so that they could live that long life. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was hard. It, they, they did the right thing by their dogs. They didn't suffer, but they can't tell you that they're not feeling good they discovered the lump on the side mm. of their leg. And I know I give my dogs vitamins because I, I want them to be in the best health possible. I give them really good food. And I think it just makes sense to try to 
not have them get the cancer. It does. And, 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 and diet's really important. Obviously, you know, our products, there, there's no cure. There is no cure for cancer. So really the best thing to do is to try to prevent it in the first place yeah. uh, and support things with like Everpop has a small amount of the dietary apoptogens that are in apocaps in a much larger dose. So if you're constantly helping cells to live and, 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 and die and, and go off naturally, that's a good thing. And just as, you know, getting exercise and just loving your dog, maybe through meditation, maybe yeah. going through hikes, whatever, and just making sure that they live the best life possible. That's, that's what I have pretty much focused on is to improve the quality of life for dogs and, and the people who love them. That's wonderful. Uh, and so next I want to talk about your dog podcast network. Or sure. I will anything- always <laughs> talk about DPN. So yeah. Uh, where do I start with that? Well, so when I was a kid growing up in DC, I did radio. I was so enamored with talk radio. Yeah. And I was like, I don't, you know, I didn't have a dog, right? So, but I, but I listened to the talk radio a lot. And there was a station in Washington, there was an NBC owned and operated station called uh, WRC. And I would listen to talk radio. And, and I knew I wanted to be in talk radio when I grew up. But before that, I said, I could do it as a teenager. So I actually, sent so many letters to them and they finally, they finally hired me and I, I worked there for a, a little while. Uh, but I, I, I love the medium of talk radio. And then in college I did radio and, and when I graduated, I almost bought a radio station and I, and I really love the medium because it's the theater of the mind and uh, you can do a lot of things with voice. And, and then podcasting came around in 2005 and I, dabbled in it because I was here in Maui and someone said, well, I was, I was co-hosting a radio, a weekly radio show uh, here in Maui. And I took the recordings from that and put them up on the internet as a podcast. And so we had an early podcast in 2005, but I never really thought of it as something serious, but people have said, you have a really nice voice. You should do yeah. something. You should do, you should do yeah. something about dogs, a dog podcast. And I thought about that for a long time and I've seen the proliferation of podcasts and there's so many out there. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I don't know, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. But I got into this habit years ago of going on these think weeks back when we could travel. Hopefully we can mm-hmm. travel again very yeah. soon. Yeah. Um, and I would travel to, uh, you oftentimes to Bangkok because I had a conference there every year. So I, I was in Bangkok in October of 2019. And I spent time like, okay, what, what, what can I do? I have these two different dog related companies and a, a publishing company and um, a supplement company. What should I do? And, and somehow I kept getting the message, a dog podcast network where you just do a lot of really high quality uh, uh, NPR quality shows focused on dog lovers. And I said, okay, I'm going to try it. I kind of wrote down some ideas and plans. I thought, well, we'll start that fresh in uh, the first quarter of 2020 and the pandemic happened. And I said, okay, this is an interesting thing because the world changed, but um, I did start building it in 2020 uh the so we have three shows on dog podcast network one is a uh the first show actually was a show called dog cancer answers where we talk with veterinarians uh about dog cancer and people ask questions and we answer those and that's proven to be really helpful but that's super niche and it's one of the shows that i'm like I, I'm sorry you have to listen to this show because, you know, if you're listening <laughs> yeah. to this show, it means you have a dog with cancer. I'm sorry you have to listen to it, but we're here. There's a large community and we've built a whole, a whole ecosystem around supporting people with dog cancer because I know how hard it is. Um, but our other shows, our flagship show, the most fun show, Chris, is uh, a show called uh, Dog Edition. And that is a news magazine formatted show it comes out currently once a week. My ambition is for it to come out twice a week, three times a week, five times a week. I'd like to do a five time a week. And it sounds it's supposed to sound a lot like all things considered, or it's, it's basically several packages really well told through narrative 
audio uh, storytelling. Uh, we have an amazing team. Um, Pamela Lawrence is in San Francisco. Caroline Winter, who just joined us from the Australian Broadcasting Corporation in, in Australia. And, uh, we're, and, we're, and we're hiring more people. And we're just trying to tell amazing stories for people to listen to while they walk their dogs, uh, which is what Dog Edition is about. And then we have another show. We're building more shows. Uh, we have a, a show coming out, uh, Ask the Veterinarian. Um, and we're just doing lots of things because I, I just love dogs. And I figure that if we produce, it's sort of like a build it and they will come. If we build great content, uh, we'll build an audience and then figure out how to make it all work financially somehow. Because I think dog edition is perfect because I do go walk in my dogs and they're about 20, 26 minutes each. And it is just the right amount of time for me. I go out about 10, 15 minutes and I come back around. And if I'm taking a super long walk, yeah, I listen to two. <laughs> I love it. That's, that's what it is. It was really, it's like, cause I think, you know, when you talk going back to the quality of life of a dog, yeah. if you are out there spend, that's what they love. And, and it's what, at least my dogs, especially Kanga really likes a meandering walk where it's, this is not much exercise for me, right? Because this yeah. is like, uh -huh. and like, just, it's like, tar, tar, I mean, we, we, we don't travel very far. She has very small legs. We don't travel very uh -huh. far, but she has smelled everything and peed uh -huh. on every little possible uh -huh. area she could, just a little <laughs> drop. But that is her joy. That is yeah. her passion. And so this is a program to listen to while you walk your dogs, regardless of how fast they walk. Absolutely. Cause I know my dogs, they, they want to charge, they want to go. And I love listening to something and I feel comfortable listening to something because I have my dogs with me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's an intimate experience. And, 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 uh, and I, I think that would, isn't that what's cool about podcasting yeah. people are listening now? I mean, you hear it in your ears, you're often on earphones or earbuds, and it's just a one-on-one -on -one relationship with uh, the host and you get immersed in the story and, and it's, it's a great opportunity to spend time with the dog and not like be, uh, bored <laughs> while, while it sniffs everything. It is a really interesting podcast. You have a co-host and you cover two or three different topics in each show. How do you get those ideas? Is it just something, um, that you plan out or is it something this is happening now? Let's do it. We work really hard. So we look for what I call dog adjacent stories. So this is not a place where you can like, here's the top five tips on how to care for your dog, or here's a new dog recipe. It's nothing like that. We cover newsy stories, uplifting stories about people who do something tangentially connected to dogs. So like our first episode was about dogs coming to the White House. We've had stories about uh, the Iditarod. We've had stories about this pilot who, uh, who basically has an airline he created just to rescue dogs from one uh, shelter to another, no-kill shelter. Uh, we are just, and luckily there are so many amazing people around the world who, who do great things for and with dogs. And those are the stories that we tell on Dog Edition. There's enough podcasts out there that tell you how to take care of your dog. Yeah. Right. To get the info about dogs and the dog news. And, and I did think of Morning Edition. I did think of NPR when I listened to it the first time. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I, I, when I started the show, I wanted to call it All Dogs Considered. Because I thought that would be like, exactly. And then I actually said, well, you know, I should, I should ask NPR if they mind. And, and guess what? They did mind. Yeah, they did. So, um, so I did the next best thing. I just named it dog edition. Cause it's a little harder to like say, well, we, we, we really don't like you use the word edition. So, uh, <laughs> but it is, it is, uh, purposefully meant to appeal to people who enjoy that type of, 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 storytelling they want you know that they're on npr you hear these things you know driveway moments yeah. well we have maybe you know whatever the equivalent dog walking moments where you just like i gotta stay out a little longer because i want to finish up this segment because it sounds so interesting because yeah. it's good for you to be able to get out and walk and listen and i do do that at that time but also i just i can't take any more bad news yes. i can't listen to podcasts like that now and then they have their place but oh i, I don't want to I don't yeah. want even the hint of it sometimes. Yeah, we know we, 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 I mean, that's sort of one of the, the motivations behind uh, dog podcast network is 
again, it was birthed in 2020, a very challenging year in a very uh, divisive period of time in, in the world. And one of my, I don't know, Chris, aspirational hopes behind Dog Podcast Network is it will bring dog lovers together, yeah. regardless of political ideology or geography, because people who love dogs, you can cross so many boundaries when you just focus on the dogs. And that's yeah. really the hope. So yeah. we are doing that, you know, both, you know, politically within the United States, yeah. but we, I so believe that we are a global, uh, we live in a, in a global society. And I really believe in the fact that, um, we we have better communication with people and now is you know with zoom and technology like this this is so easy to connect with people all over the world so you'll hear stories from australia from england from ireland from hong kong from new zealand pretty much all over and we have listeners all over the world who are just as equally passionate about their dogs as someone who's living in i don't know sheboygan so you are well traveled and I know that you talk to a real variety of people um, on your dog edition. And is there a common theme amongst dog owners or are there different types of dog owners per se, depending on the country? Both. And I know that's a weasel answer. Uh, there's the commonality that they love their dogs they you know like one of so here's the thing so i ask people what's the difference between a dog owner or a dog lover and i and there's several questions that i've determined over the years that will help me classify where someone is so i said mm -hmm. uh where does your dog sleep does your dog <laughs> sleep in your bedroom or your bed they're you're, you're probably a dog lover if they're like i have a dog house outside okay <laughs> um uh okay so your dog is sick and you are sick who is more likely to go to the doctor slash veterinarian? Well, the dog. Well, yeah. okay, you're probably. <laughs> you're probably uh, at Christmas time, do you give your dog a present? Of course I give my dog a present. Those are the, these are the types of things that I'm like, that's a yeah. dog lover. And those are universal. So it yeah. doesn't matter if you're in a country that, you know, traditionally years ago, maybe eight dogs. There are still people who are dog lovers today who are passionate and do it this you know love them the same way we love them anyway but then the distinctions and the and the language and the way they uh feed their dog and the way they uh view veterinary medicine yeah. is different in places all over the world and so i help to get people to talk about that and celebrate those differences and give us a sense that there's both this bond and there's there's difference yeah, I'm sure that I can see where there would be some cultural differences in in the care and the feeding mm -hmm. of of dogs for sure. So, do you talk to your dog? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. And do you and, find and I listen more more importantly, yeah. I, I think it's so I talk. Yeah. And I think <laughs> okay, so we'll go back to again way back. My first project ever with dogs, ever with pets, years ago when I was 22 years old, I found a famous quote unquote pet psychic who was the original pet psychic. Her name was Beatrice Lidecker. And she was like the pet psychic to Secretariat, the racehorse. Uh, and, 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 and she was on Merv Griffin and all this. And, and I had a video production company in Washington, DC. And, and we did a video called um, You Two Can Talk with the Animals. And basically, and we sold it in Parade Magazine, and it, it sold like a million copies of this, of this $20 VHS tape. And it was about how to communicate with animals. And, and she, so that informed my life with this, you know, kind of like a little slightly nutty, interesting, kind of like definitely out there person. But I learned that when I was so young and I was, you know, sharing this and promoting this. And I learned that animals do think, they just think in nonverbal communication. So you got to communicate with them nonverbally. And so they probably have the intelligence of a ah, three-year-old. I mean, this isn't, you're not going to sit and yeah. talk. Einstein, uh, <laughs> Plato, uh, Pl Plato. I mean, yeah. this is just like, but, but two oh, or three, yeah. you know, they, they get the basic stuff. Uh -huh. But if you're able to kind of believe you can visualize what 
the messages that they're seeing and, and you're hearing. And anyway, so there's a whole nonverbal communication. So I do talk to my dogs, but more importantly, I listen yeah. to them. And that is a rapport that I have built over the years. And one of my dogs totally knows like that. I, I, if I need to say something, I'll just look in your eyes and like, think the thought, think the thought, think the thought. And of course I say, it, and then she like gives me affirmation, like, that's it. Thank you. Good job. Good <laughs> job, dad. Well, because there is the uh, realm of thought that they know a hundred of our words, give or mm -hmm. take. And we know eh, a few barks. We know three yeah. or four barks. <laughs> yeah. I, I think that is totally true. And, and they do know our words and there's obviously there's, you know, a lot of stuff that's coming in the news we're going to do we're doing a story on this on dog edition soon about this about dogs who are being trained to be able to press buttons to synthesize well that have single words so they can basically communicate in sentences uh using using you know like 20 different buttons and so dogs definitely have the ability to string together thoughts and we just have to be able to open our minds to listen to them do you think there's such a thing as just a dumb dog? I do. Yeah. I'm their dumb people. They're dumb. I mean, we, know, we know that, right? There are some people who are like, uh -huh. okay, just maybe they see the world a little differently or they just don't have all the, the synapses. Yeah. And so, yeah, there are some dumb dogs. I mean, I think that that's the thing. When I wrote how to meditate with your dog, people would say, well, what if I have more than one dog? I'm like, uh -huh. there's one dog that you're going to be more drawn to meditate with you'll you'll know it so this is like yeah. a nasty thing it's like saying which of your children do you love more it's, <laughs> it, no one ever yeah. wants to say that but deep down i think most parents yeah. like there's this one yeah. uh so I, I have two dogs i said kanga and rue and one is much uh smarter than the other and so i enjoy my conversations a bit more with yeah that dog but I won't let the other one hear this because they li <laughs> they listen to podcasts all the time. For sure, mine do too. Uh, and because I think I think that there are smart dogs, and I do think there are dumb dogs, and I think that you know, just like you said, there's there's room in the world for both kinds. There are because they well, they're, what they there, but there are no dogs with with small hearts. They yeah. all love, and sometimes yes. they've been abused, and mm -hmm. and. Uh, and and it's and it's really tough. And this is where you know expert trainers and people who are animal behaviorists really fit in. And I and I really applaud what they do. But dogs do emanate love, and you can connect with a dog by just using your your heart. Almost yeah. in every case, um, it just may take a little longer. They know. Dogs know, and I do think. I've always, in talking with some of my clients, I think dogs know a bad person. I've only had one dog in my life that's truly hated somebody. And I, yeah. they, ultimately, I found out they were a bad person. I kind of yeah. thought, I, I think that people give off pheromones if you're a bad person. Do you think that's true? And the dogs, they have such a heightened sense of smell. I, I think they, I think uh, they, pheromones are definitely one of it. And that's, that's, that's kind of an easy one. Like we know that mm -hmm. everyone smells differently and, and dogs uh -huh. have a sense of smell that I think is 10,000 times greater than ours. But I think there's even some other stuff like my smart dog will watch TV. And if she sees a character who later on turns out to be a bad character, she knew it from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And I, I do not know. My wife and I look at this and she, my wife's a writer and, you know, she's very good at fiction. Sometimes, but it is, abs none of, you know, we're not supposed to know this is a bad character. They just turn out to be, but Kanga knows ahead of time. And if there's a gun or if there's any violence, she hates it. She doesn't, not a big fan of horses. So she truly watches television in a way that, um, when uh, I had a, a friend, Dr. Dressler, the veterinarian, uh, when she was a little puppy, she said, this dog can never see bad things. Just keep, keep, keep her away from anything. And she doesn't like any friction or, or, or anything like that because they're deeply sensitive. So I think it's a smell, but they're not emanating smells off television. Uh -huh. She's just able to, to, to grasp things that uh, are nonverbal. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with you. And that's what I've found in my own life too. Yeah. 
And what's next for you? Is it just developing the podcast network, developing the podcasts? Yeah, we we are trying to uh, bring more podcasts out there and obviously find more uh, listeners. And we are hiring. We're, we're, we're looking for people who just even want to contribute a segment for uh, Dog Edition. We have a contest, it's called 101 Dog Stories, where we will buy people segments. We're giving away $15,000 in prize money. And we are just looking to, to make this the place for anyone who loves dogs to discover something fun and interesting about, um, about the species that they love so much. And I was reading about the stories contest. What kind of stories? Any kind of dog story? Anything, anything. I mean, there was a product. I think you have to listen to dog edition first to, to get this. It's not like just, we have high production standards, Yeah. but um, there are so many people who can tell great stories and it can be, oh, I don't know, a story about a dog that meant something to you or a story about someone who's doing great things to support dogs or a story about a business that has this really cool product or there's so many things that are dog adjacent or the environmental impact of poop bags or the, you know, the, 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 the there's just so many, I think there's pretty much any story in life nearly one of the challenges in our in our production meetings is to basically look at the world through the perspective of how is a dog impacted how is a dog contributory to the significance of this story and to present things in such a way that uh express that dog centric that dog adjacency and so there's so many ways of, of doing that and the, we're looking for short stories they're like you know five eight minutes long um, and uh, to help uh, build a, a larger audience and to let more people know about these great ideas. Yeah, there's a vast amount of stories that you can write about a dog. And I think that that's a, I think that that just sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> it is. I, I, I hope people uh, uh, check it out because the more people who are sharing stories, the more people who are a part of this I think the better the world gets. As I said earlier, my my overarching mission is to help improve the quality of life for dogs and the people who love them. And these stories are one way of doing that. Uh, and these are the types of things, hopefully, that people sit around and you know at the water cooler or at dinner or at the dog park and say, "Did you hear about?" Blah, 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 blah. And then you know, this is good. This is what we want. And I say this in jokingly, but what do you think about people who don't like dogs? Do they have those? Uh, uh, they're they're <laughs> yeah. fine. They're okay. Yeah. I, I I choose. Uh, they 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 obviously come in into my life, uh, and uh, they're they're fine. They don't they don't understand me because they obviously think dog lovers are wacko. Um, and I think part of what I try to do is validate. You know, there are a lot of us wackos out there who live normal lives and 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 but you know by day but by night we just really want to to hang out on the couch with the dog or or go for a walk or give him a belly scratch or contemplate what i'm going to cook my dog for dinner uh uh -huh. and those are okay people who plan family vacations about around hotels and and, and venues that uh -huh. enable you to bring your dog yeah. yeah i tend to think about people i just think their lives are less full uh, you know, there's, there's, you know, there might be this little empty spot that they don't know, that they don't know that they have. A different, <laughs> different strokes for different folks. I yeah. mean, you know, I think some people like that. What do you, what is that animal called? It's a, a cat. Uh, no, uh, I'm oh yeah. I know you, you have a new mine. kitten. Yeah, I, just, uh, <laughs> no, I mean, you know, there it's like yeah. the whole cat people, dog people, yeah. people who are not pet people. I get it. I totally get it. I have allergies. I have it, yeah. but um, yeah, it, it just makes the world diverse and i think you know we're we're all we're all uh creatures some of us have yeah. two legs and some of us have four legs yeah i think dogs make the world such a better place because they just love you no matter what mm -hmm. they don't care if you're a good person or a bad person mm -hmm. as long as you treat them well and you feed them they love you mm -hmm. period yeah that's why they're such a, a great a meditation companion because they really know how to be love they really know how to be in the moment they know how to help us express yeah. our humanity as they express their uh 
uh, dogness. Yeah. Yeah. They, they add so much to our lives for sure. And so uh, do you have any nicknames for your dogs? No, I love the, the dual name of Kanga and Rue. Kanga and Rue. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like to name things, I guess. Uh, so I have naming rights. Uh, so yeah, I, we got Kanga and I, I named her Kanga with the idea that maybe someday there'd be a, a, a Rue coming along. And then uh, an opportunity came to rescue a Maltese from uh, uh, a lady who had, uh, was no longer able to take care of her. And uh, it was a very cute little Maltese named Tinkerbell. And Tinkerbell was an awfully, not the best. I just didn't feel very comfortable like walking down the beach. I'm a big guy walking down the beach. Like, Tinkerbell, Tinkerbell. So um, yeah. I, uh, I, I, I gently changed her name, but I was nervous about it because when we adopted Tinkerbell officially, everything you know we knew everything everything was all settled and then the owner uh handed her over and said now whatever you do don't change your name and i'm like okay um <laughs> so this is like i'm like okay so for a while i called her tink i tried you know bell or tinker or whatever it didn't quite work and then and then so gradually we we started calling her rue well this woman before she left the island uh, to, to, to go back to the mainland, her daughter came by to say hello to uh, Tinkerbell. And she came over and the dog was very happy to see her. And it, it was just a lovely conversation. And we were quick. We had already gotten uh, Rue her tag, but we put on, we had, we put the back, the tag that said Tinkerbell on her collar. And we thought everything was good. We don't, she just, what she doesn't know isn't going to kill her. It's fine. Yeah. And so then the daughter puts mom in the car and comes back and says, you know, she seems to really be enjoying the house. This means so much to my mom. I love this. And, 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 and she actually likes her new name. I was like, well, what do you mean her new name? Well, <laughs> you're calling her Rue. I'm like, uh, yeah, uh, how did you know? And she said, oh, I'm a pet psychic. Kanga told me. Oh. <laughs> so I was like, aha, this is like, I have had these different experiences in my life where you're like, uh, God smacked. And, and that was one of them. And it was like, okay, well, yeah, I, I, that's funny. So anyway, that is my, that's my story of, of um, being caught by my tattling Kanga. She's the, <laughs> she's the loquacious smart one who watches TV. Uh, and uh, she just like, Rue didn't, Rue didn't tell her, but, but Kanga told her. That's, that's funny. And that's a, that's a fun, good story. Uh, and that should uh, be so on Dog Edition. We haven't, I've never told be. that. Yeah. I haven't told that story before. Yeah. Cause you know, they say don't change dogs names, you know, or yeah. it takes a very long time or do it right. something similar and i've changed pets names but it's been within the first few weeks <laughs> yeah yeah well this was within the first few weeks of wow. her living with us not of her having yeah. her life on this planet yeah. uh but she really is much more of a rude than a tinkerbell but yeah that's cool yeah i can't and that is one of the things that I say when you're thinking about naming your dog. What's it going to sound like when you're yelling for your dog, you know, across the yes. dog park it's or out your door? Hard <laughs> to yell Tinkerbell sternly. Rue, a little easier. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, so you you like Maltese. Do you have in the back of your mind, you know, a different kind of a dog in the future? Or are you going to uh, probably stick with Maltese? I tend to like Maltese, uh, so this is these are, I've had I've had a few and I, I like them, but uh, I'm definitely open to whatever the universe has. Yeah. I, I I you know uh, I, I, dogs come into my life, and you know we try to uh, resist bringing so many that the house is over overtaken by dogs because <laughs> uh, I do run a podcasting network and they make a lot of noise, uh, but. I will see whatever the universe has, has in mind. But I, at this point, I'm, I'm pretty stuck on my, I, what I like about Maltese are, well, the hypoallergenic components. And because I am allergic to, well, to cats for sure. And um, the portability. So uh, I definitely like the portability and the idea that you just pick them up and, and, and take them someplace. That's awesome. 
And so you do run the podcast network. If they do bark in the background, do you cut it out? That's a really interesting question. Um, they know when the red light is on not to bark. How's that? Cool. Uh, but but that's during recording sessions. Now, obviously, most of the time we have meetings and uh, there, you know, we, we live in a world where you spend a lot of time on Zoom and Microsoft Teams and everything. And no, that those are that's a total cacophony. And what's funny is my dog will be barking because she heard a dog, you know, in New York who is barking because she heard a dog in London and they and all these dogs are barking because they're being picked up on the speaker and people aren't using headphones. And so it's kind of a funny phenomena that probably another story for that would, again, another type of story that dog edition yeah. would cover is how dogs communicate over zoom with one another by barking. <laughs> yeah. And, and I'm sure that they would too. I have my headphones in and you can slightly hear from time to time. And my, dog trainer that I have on the podcast she has said some things before and all of a sudden the dog's barking mm -hmm. she's uh, barking and it's yeah I don't cut it out I leave yeah. it there <laughs> I think it's, I think it's fair I think if you're if you're someone who is listening to a podcast intended for dog lovers mm -hmm. you are very forgiving of all the things that happen when you have a dog mm -hmm. in a recording situation and even on my serious podcast she barked mm -hmm. and the guest didn't mind so I left it in I think that's fine. I, I I think that, you know, that is the way they're communicating. And yeah. and sometimes they, they bark at the most inopportune times, but often it is to punctuate something or a, a pause in the conversation, or they're just communicating something that they're able to pick up on. And so I, I think it's okay. But yeah. we, because we have, you know, we're really trying to be mm -hmm. BBC or NPR yeah. standards. We, we oh, try yeah. to not have a, a lot of dog barking. Now we, you know, where we do use barking, Chris, um, expletives. So if someone says oh, something they yeah. shouldn't, shouldn't say in order to be family friendly, instead of bleeping it, we, we cover it with a dog bark and we Can have I different dog barks. Idea? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, so when they say, when they say a, a bad word, so we have different barks that mean different things. So there's like yeah. a lexicon here, like this, this word means this, this word means this. And so we, we, we try to match it, but hopefully we don't have a lot of profanity, but no profanity is all covered by barks. Yeah. That's awesome. If I ever have profanity, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> that's much better than bleep. Yeah. yeah, that's, that's, I, I like that idea. That sounds like a lot of fun. And uh, do you have a favorite dog movie? I am a sucker for anything that makes me cry. Okay. Yeah. Like dog movies that make me yeah. cry. So I, um, I like the art of racing in the rain. A oh, lot. yeah. And I like, I like it because, well, and we did a segment on dog edition and also on, so the other show I do is called the long leash, which is like a much, it's a show like this. Yeah. that is a lot more conversation. Yeah. And sorry, I talked to the film writer, the, the, the guy who wrote the screenplay for that movie and it's great, but I love movies that just make me cry. I, I was watching that on an airplane and the flight attendant was awfully concerned that I was having some emotional breakdown or having some like problems. Like, are you okay? You, you seem very, I'm like, it's a movie, it's a word. <laughs> uh, so I like that type of thing because other than that, I don't cry in real life. So I, yeah. I, need, a, I need a movie to do that. And a do dog movie will do it. Yeah, the release. What about that. you? I love, oh, I love, uh, I love the Beethoven movies. I think they're fun. Mm -hmm. um you know Definitely not cry worthy oh uh, yeah. no but old Flash. yeller old yeller oh my gosh and then what's that one where they go across canada the two dogs and the cat i can't remember the greatest mm. journey something like that i i love that one i saw that when i was a kid and yeah. i was just like wow well, there <laughs> there are some great movies from like our childhood <gasps> that Disney like movies. benji benji oh, benji yeah yeah I, 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 amazing films now again kanga because she watches tv i can't watch movies that have a lot of dogs so oftentimes we interview uh people filmmakers who make movies about dogs i cannot watch that upstairs in the living room because <laughs> kanga will just oh, yell yeah. at the screen the whole time and they can't oh, yeah. watch it and take notes so yeah. i come to my office and do it you know and to talk about the long leash you because you brought that up we didn't talk about it I did listen to that. And you cover 
you know, in depth, some really, really interesting subjects. And the, the you know, the woman who lost her three dogs mm. oh, during Levine. COVID. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, I cried a lot. I just, mm. it's, but it's something that doesn't get talked about. And so I was so glad you did that. We try to really tackle things that uh, are bold and make a difference. I mean, that was sort of the, the significance of that because mm-hmm. everyone who has a dog yes. eventually, hopefully, will outlive their dog and they will have to make a very difficult decision. Yeah. And this is a woman who lost her, and she's a massive dog lover, pet lover, lost three dogs in quick succession, uh, some days apart. And she is eloquent and talks about what she did, the rituals that she created to make the uh, experience at the veterinarian's office uh, more palatable for the dog and looking into their eyes and playing a certain song. and, And it is a really poignant interview. It's the type of stuff that we try to do where we find, I mean, this, these are people you, you would have never heard from or about, and we engage them in conversation. And uh, I, I am, I, I like to talk to people and I like to, 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 to pull out the interesting things. And sometimes when it's a really long, good interview like that, we, it makes it a long leash. That was particular. That one stands out. I cried through that because I, I totally understand. I've lost a lot of pets, and mm-hmm. and and I was so happy that you that you covered that. There's so many fun stories that get condensed for the dog edition. Dog edition. Yeah. yeah. So that's the thing. I mean, so we we try to repurpose because, but so in order to make a dog edition segment that is five or eight minutes long, we may have five hours of tape. Uh, and m- interview multiple people. And in order for me to do an interview with someone, I spend two or three hours, whatever it takes, pre- prepping for the interview and really getting. To, you know, so there's a lot of work. And then someone's my someone really brilliant. My wife said, "You should let people hear some of those really yeah. good interviews." And that's how the Long Leash was born. And it turned. It turns out that we have a. I was looking at some. Uh, podcast statistics we have a very large like the female listenership to that show is a hundred percent like i don't think guys listen to that show at all it is all women but Mm -hmm. um it's it's fun thank your wife for me okay i will (laughs) tell her spot on because i i like the long shows and uh along with dog edition it was that's that it's very high quality it's a wonderful show and Anybody who's listening definitely should should go and 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 take a listen. And uh, James, you're you're such a fun guest. It's been wonderful talking with you today. Thank you. It's been awesome talking to you. I enjoyed this conversation. Mm-hmm.